This video tutorial deals with the nomenclature for ionic compounds, specifically those that involve elements with multiple valence charges. Now, some elements on the periodic table are monovalent, mono meaning one, thus they only have one valence charge. So as you can see here on the valence sheet, uh, some elements only have one valence charge, while others have multiple valence charges. Multiple over here, mono over here. Thus, these elements are called multivalent, meaning that they can have more than one valence charge, depending on who they're reacting with and in what situation it's undergoing the chemical reaction. Now, the naming system for these compounds is pretty much identical to the ones in the last video clip on monovalent ionic compounds, but there is one additional step. You must indicate which valence charge it is. So for instance, saying iron oxide is not good enough, you must tell me which iron oxide is it. If you look at iron on the valence sheet, you'll see that iron has two options, 2 plus or 3 plus, meaning it can either lose two electrons or lose three electrons to achieve stability. So just saying iron oxide is not good enough, you must tell me which iron is it. Is it iron 2 oxide or is it iron 3 oxide? Now you'll notice that inside here, we're using Roman numerals and not uh, the Arabic numerals that we're used to. So make sure you know your Roman numerals. Over here is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. However, uh, for our purposes, we probably won't go anywhere above 5. So this is probably all you need to know for our course anyway. So let's do an example. The first one we need to look at is iron 2 oxide. Before we start, let's double check to see if we're using the right naming system. Iron and oxygen. Looking at the periodic table, you see that iron is in the metal section and oxygen is in the non-metal section. And because we can use this naming system only if it's a metal bonded to a non-metal, then yes, we are allowed to use this naming system because it's a metal bonded to a non-metal. Next step, write out the symbols. So the symbol for iron is F E. Now oxide used to be called oxygen and its symbol is O. Now we need to identify the valence charges. Now if we look at oxygen, the valence charge is going to be a 2 minus because oxygen is in group 6A. And in group 6A, these elements over here have a 2 minus charge. If you want to double check, oxygen over here, 2 minus charge. So I write a little 2 minus at the top. Now iron on the other hand is either a 2 plus charge or a 3 plus charge. So I'm going to write a 2 plus and a 3 plus above here. So now my options are 2 plus or 3 plus. Which one should I choose? Take a look at this symbol over here. Because this symbol says it's a 2, iron 2, therefore I know it's an iron 2 plus, not an iron 3 plus. So, check mark. Next step, insert subscripts by following the zero sum rule. So remember the zero sum rule states that the valence charges above must add up to zero. All right, so over here we got two plus and a two minus. So I have a two plus charge and a two minus charge. If I add these two charges up together, they do add up to zero. So therefore this is the correct uh, chemical formula. It is stable. So at this point I can just erase all that rough work and there's my final answer. Iron 2 oxide is FeO, that is the chemical formula. Let's try iron 3 oxide. So once again I know iron and oxygen, non -metal, this metal and a non-metal bond together so I can use this naming system. First step, write out the symbols. F, E, and an O, iron and oxygen. Next step, identify the valence charges. So as I did before, 2 minus charge, 2 plus, or 3 plus option. Now, which one do I choose, 2 plus or 3 plus? As indicated by the Roman numerals here, it is an iron 3 plus, not an iron 2 plus. Now here's a little hint for you. Uh, it also works for balancing chemical equations. Whenever you see a 3 and a 2, the number you should think of is 6. All right. So over here I've got a 3 plus charge and I've got a 2 minus charge. If I add them together, that does not equal 0. 
so it doesn't follow my zero sum rule in order to become stable. So what I need to do is I need to make them equal by following this situation. If I get three oxygens, I can have six minus altogether. On the other hand, if I have two irons, then I get a six positive. And that's why I'm going to write two. So this two means that I have two of these irons, and they add up to six positive. This three means I have three oxygens, one, two, three, and each of the oxygens has two minus charge, so two minus, two minus, two minus adds up to a six minus altogether. So at this point, six positive and six minus do equal to zero. And so this is my final answer. Let me just erase the rough work. And there we have it. The final answer for iron 3 oxide, or the proper formula for iron 3 oxide, is Fe2, meaning I needed two irons, and O3, meaning I needed three oxygens in order to balance out the zero sum rule. Now, a common error many students make with this naming system is they'll write down, well, Fe, iron, oxide, O. Oh. But then as soon as they see the 2, they'll think, oh, maybe I should write down a 2 over here. Or the other option a lot of students will do is they might write down uh, Fe, and they'll think that 2 belongs to this oxygen, so they'll put a 2 there. These are both incorrect. Please remember that this 2 is the valence charge above the Fe. You still must use the zero sum rule to figure, figure that one out. So over here, a uh, common mistake a lot of students will make, they'll go Fe, oxygen, there's a 3, so it must be a 3 here wrong. Uh, or they might go Fe, O, and this 3, they might think 3 belongs here, and they'll put that there. Wrong. Can't do that either. Now I also know that a lot of students like to use the crisscross rule, where they'll go, okay, well, iron is 2 plus, or it could be 3 plus, oxygen is a 2 minus charge. So what we do is we figure out, first of all, what is the charge on iron? Well, it says iron 2, so it must be the 2. Can't be the 3 delete that one there. Now how does the crisscross rule work? You basically criss and cross. So you bring the two down here and you bring the two over here. Two and two we must lower it down to the lowest possible number so we divide everything by two, FEO. I personally don't like the crisscross rule just because uh, it doesn't tell you anything. If I ask a student why are you crisscrossing they have no clue why are they crisscrossing. On the other hand, over here, if you follow the zero sum rule, then you know why the numbers at the bottom are one and one, because you want to have a stable compound with a zero, a net charge of zero, versus just you know crisscrossing because you are crisscrossing. There's no reason behind that. You don't know why you're doing it. Now, of course, if you have no clue what you're doing on a test, uh, please just crisscross to your heart's delight. It will work about 90% of the time. Most situations, you will be able to just crisscross straight up and not need to know why, and you can still get the right answer. However, if you're looking for that above 90%, then you need to know why you're doing it, and that is because of the zero sum rule. So over here, FeO, it's a 3 plus charge because of this, iron 3 plus, and oxygen is always a 2 minus charge, so if we had crisscrossed, it would have been Fe2O3, which is the same answer as this one over here, except with this one, I know why I have the number 2 and the number 3. So I can have a total charge of 0. Over here, when you're crisscrossing, you have no clue why you're putting the 2 down there. You're just crisscrossing. That's it. Now let's talk about uh, what happens if we want to go from a chemical formula into the chemical name. So going in the reverse order. First step, check to see that it is the right naming system. So we have copper, which is a metal, oxygen, which is a non-metal. And because it's a metal bonded with a non-metal, we can use the naming system that we've learned so far. To do this, we just follow two simple steps. First step, write out the element name, including the IDE suffix. So copper keeps its full name. Nothing changes with that because it's a metal. And oxygen is now known as oxide. Second step, identify the multivalent charge and insert it in the brackets. Well, let's take a look at it. What's the valence charge for oxygen? Well, oxygen is in group 6A, and we know that everyone in group 6A has a 2 minus charge. So we write the 2 minus above here. Copper, on the other hand, is a transition metal, and like we said, transition metals do not follow the patterns very well, so we have to memorize their valence charges. Looking at the valence sheet, we see that copper has a 1 plus charge or a 2 plus charge. 
So I'm going to write a 1 plus or a 2 plus. So which one could it be? 1 plus or 2 plus? Well, if you know the zero sum rule states that basically when you add up these two charges, they should add up to zero. So which valence charge would allow it to add up to zero? If I went 1 plus versus 2 minus and I add them together, I do not get zero. I get negative 1 instead. So I know it can't be the 1 plus then. So the only possibility is if it was a 2 plus. Because 2 plus and a 2 minus do add up to zero. So since I know it's a 2 plus charge, not the 1 plus, I can say 2. Copper, 2, oxide. And this is another reason why I prefer to do the zero sum rule instead of the crisscross. Because if you crisscross, you would have thought that this was a 1 plus, And this would be a 1 minus. Because there are no numbers over here. So you would assume it's just a 1. And this is the 10% case where the crisscross rule does not work. So please, where possible, use the zero sum rule. All right, let's take a look at another example over here. All right, first up, write out the element name, including the IDE suffix. So PB stands for lead. And F stands for fluorine. However, it used to be called fluorine, but now it's called fluoride with the IDE suffix. Next step, identify the multivalent charges and insert in brackets. So I'm going to leave a bracket over here because I know I'm going to put a charge in. Fluorine. Fluorine is located over here, and it is in group 7A, which means it has a 1 minus charge, because everyone in this group has a 1 minus charge. So we put the 1 minus over here. Lead, on the other hand, is a multivalent element, meaning it has a 2 plus charge or a 4 plus charge. So I'm going to write 2 plus or 4 plus. I don't know which one it is. So to find it out, what I need to do is multiply. Well, I got fluorines. How many of them do I have? I've got four fluorines. So that means I got one minus, one minus, one minus, one minus, for a total of four minus charge. Now lead, I only have one lead. So which one would allow me to have a zero sum rule? Two plus or the four plus? Well, if I had two plus, it would only be able to eliminate two of these, meaning I would still have a deficit of two minus charge. So that's not zero. So it cannot be the 2 plus, it must be the 4 plus instead. With a 4 positive and a 4 negative, that adds up to 0, and that follows my zero sum rule, meaning it is lead 4. And if you remember, Roman numerals, there's the 4. Lead 4 fluoride. So now the problem becomes, how do I memorize all these multivalent charges? The monovalent charges aren't too bad, you just look at the periodic table, follow the pattern, and you've got the valence charge. But the multivalent ones though, it's the, the, the pattern isn't as obvious. And so what I had to do is make up my own pattern. This page summarizes all the multivalent elements that you are most likely to encounter in this course. All right? So here we have antimony and arsenic with a 3 plus or 4 plus charge. Lead, manganese, and tin tend to have a 2 plus or 4 plus charge. Iron, cobalt, and nickel tend to have a 2 plus or 3 plus whereas copper and mercury tend to have a 1 plus or 2 plus. Now, it has been in my experience that the dumber something is, the easier it is to remember. So I have created some really stupid memory devices to help me out in memorizing this uh, multivalent chart. So take for instance this one. Peanut butter man's son is 24 years old. Wow, that is pretty stupid. So stupid, in fact, that I've managed to keep it in my memory for the last 10 years. Another gem that I have is this one over here. See you. Hug. 1 plus 2 plus. Not just stupid, but also cute and memorable. That's the key word over there. So feel free to make up your own memory devices for each and every one of these. All right, the dumber, the better, in my opinion. But most importantly, once you have this memorized, you've got the whole upper portion of this common valence sheet in your head. So the next video clip I'll be covering will uh, look at the uh, what's it called the polyatomic ions and when to use them and also how I memorize the seven primary ones.